We're, we're looking for a female looking missing for a person female. who's been missing, missing for about 11 days. Okay, she's been missing yeah. for 11 days, so obviously we need to find <laughs> her. Okay. And because you, you look like the you person look... we've seen on CCTV, we just oh, yeah, well, right. get some details off um, on the 14th of May 2019, a woman by the name of Julia Rawson was reported missing by her partner. She hadn't been seen for three days. Police used the town's CCTV footage to find Julia's last movements. Who and what was seen on that footage would solve an awfully chilling murder case in the town of Dudley, England. The duo's motives behind the crime were equally chilling. Jack the Ripper, son of Sam, BTK, the Zodiac Killer, the Hillside Strangler, the Toolbox Killers, the Killer Clown, countless other names. These serial killers and many others have been the perpetrators of horrible crimes throughout history. And yet, despite their heinous crimes, and some of them facing the longest possible sentences or meeting grisly ends, there seems to be a sort of fascination for them. A fascination that can often end up making them immortal. For example, Jack the Ripper lived over 100 years ago, and his actions were so gruesome, he was sometimes regarded as an otherworldly presence. But he is still spoken about with some sort of reverence. Through their infamous actions, they attain a level of fame that is unlike any other. There is an entire culture that is dedicated to the world of serial killers. As Julia Beck for The Atlantic puts it, in trying to make sense of the darkest extremes of human behavior, the public turns murderers into myths and monsters. It is this research into what makes human darkness tick that affords celebrity status for many serial killers. This is why they may live on in history and be remembered by the public far more readily than those who have completed more noble acts. At the end of the day, the desire to see what drives the mind of the serial killer is an attraction many are drawn to. Most times it's harmless and people in the world of serial killer fandom do it within the bounds of mild weirdness. Most people know how and where to draw the lines between what is a pop culture reference and what is just downright wrong. But as we have the good, so does the bad find its way to the fore. And this could lead to deadly consequences. Welcome to Twisted Minds. And as you know, we take deep dives into the darker parts of human nature. Today, we take a look at what happens when a fascination with serial killers becomes an unhealthy obsession, and how it led Nathan Maynard Ellis and David Leasley to the murder of Julia Ross. Julia Rawson was a 42-year-old artist who lived on New Mill Street in Dudley, West Midlands, England. She was known affectionately to her friends as Jew, and had a longtime partner named Elaine Higginson. The couple had planned to move in together, having been together for two decades. They had once lived together in the past, but then separated and eventually rekindled their relationship. Julia was well known within their community for her positive, and kind nature. She was also very outgoing. She was described as dressing like a rock star or the leader of a rock band and was very confident. And you would typically find her in and around local pubs, cheering on local bands and talking to friends. She was that type of person that even if you didn't know her personally, you might have heard of her. Julia grew up in Stafford, 25 miles north of Dudley. She was an avid lover of art, even going on to study it at the University of Birmingham in her youth. To make money, she and Elaine ran a store out of the Dudley market, specializing in the sale of pagan-related items. On May 11, 2019, a Saturday just like any other, Julia and Elaine had spent the weekend in neighboring Wolverhampton. And as the day ended, they disagreed on their choice of evening activities. Elaine was tired and just wanted to relax at home, while Julia was having too much fun and wanted to spend some more time outside. So the couple said goodbye to each other, with Elaine going home and Julia boarding a bus to Birmingham. However, she would find out that she had accidentally taken a bus that was headed to Dudley, a mistake that she didn't consider too serious, seeing as she lived there. Julia would go to the local pub called Bottle and Cork and order a drink. The pub is located about 150 yards away from where Julia reportedly lived. It has a very sophisticated CCTV system that records all of the pub's activities from 5 p.m. till 2 a.m. Julia had spent a couple of hours in the pub when an unknown male walked in at about 10 47 p.m. carrying a shopping bag. He sat by himself and ordered a drink. Recognizing him as someone she did not know and not wanting to sit alone, Julia introduced herself and seemed to show interest in his very distinctive forearm tattoos. She kept the stranger company all throughout the night until the pub closed at 2 a.m. and they left together to an unknown destination. Apparently, Julia had felt the night 
was still too young and did not want to go home yet. That was the last time anyone ever saw Julia Ross in the line. It's about this time that we take a look at Nathan Maynard Ellis, who plays a central role in Julia's last moments. Nathan Maynard Ellis was born on May 21st, 1990. He suffered from a form of autism that affected his ability to interact with people in a normal fashion. It also made his behavior and thinking patterns rigid and repetitive. Nathan was described as having a penchant for violence, especially against women, and was well known by social services. He had been quoted as having dark thoughts, which involved torturing, taking sexual advantage of, and killing women. Not surprisingly, he had an unhealthy obsession with true crime and horror movies. He had books full of crimes that serial killers had committed. Some of his fixations were on Levi Belfield, The Bus Stop Stalker, Peter Sutcliffe, The Yorkshire Ripper, Jeffrey Dahmer, The Milwaukee Cannibal, Ed Kemper, The Co-Ed Killer, Harold Shipman, Dr. Death, and many others. He had custom horror movie masks in his flat of horrors, which was the name that media and authorities gave to his apartment upon investigation. These masks were strewn all over the walls, and there were others he hadn't finished working on. Horror movie memorabilia covered most of the apartment, and reports described the Tipton located apartment as having a choked appearance. Nathan was also a criminology student at some point, although it's unclear what his education status was when he met Julia Rossi. Julia and Nathan were seen leaving the pub together and shared a taxi that presumably took them to Nathan's flat in Tipton. No one is sure what happened once they arrived there, but you can imagine how unnerving it must have been for Julia once she entered his flat. Elaine last spoke to Julia just before 11 p.m. on May 11th, when she woke up the next day and couldn't find Julia and saw that none of her calls or messages had been answered, she became worried. It had been 10 hours since their last contact, so she called her sister Jacqueline to ask for advice on what to do next. Jacqueline suggested calling the police and also said it might be a good idea to retrace Julia's steps from the night before to see if any clues could be found. Of course, the search came up short. Elaine then called the police and a missing person report was filed. In the course of their investigation, the police reviewed the CCTV footage and saw Julia talking to the unidentified man at the bar. They asked Elaine if she knew who he was and after she couldn't, he was marked as the case's first lead. Julia's friends took the investigation up a notch, posting social media appeals and asking anyone if they had seen Julia. They also placed missing persons posters all around the community, hoping someone would come forward. The images of the unidentified man were printed and passed around to the police community support officers. This would eventually lead to the finding and arrest of Nathan Maynard Ellis. On May 22, 2019, 10 days after Julia's disappearance, a security guard at a Dudley shopping center got in touch with the police and informed them that he had just seen someone matching the description of the unidentified man. His forearm tattoos were a dead giveaway. In truth, Nathan Maynard Ellis wasn't a hard man to identify. Rather, he stood out with a full beard and a cap, the same one he had been wearing when he was captured by the CCTV camera. He was in the company of his partner, David Leasley. Nathan initially denied knowing anything about Julia Rawson, going as far as saying he didn't even know there was a missing woman. He denied spending the evening of May 11th with her at the pub. Furthermore, he made a disturbing joke saying, if I was responsible for someone being missing for 11 days, I would probably have chopped off all my hair. It was probably the most uncomfortable joke the authorities had ever heard, especially in the grand scheme of things. It was all they needed, however, to arrest both men on suspicion of kidnapping Julia Rawson. Their flat was subsequently searched and its contents were documented. The flat of horrors is a stone throw away from the Birmingham Canal, further down from its Victoria Park. The canal is also sided by an extensive barren wasteland, leading into a railway line that is no longer in use. These areas were locations where the police would search for the now presumed dead Julia Rawson. News of the arrest spread like wildfire, leading to a witness who had been mentally, physically, and sexually taken advantage of by Nathan Maynard Ellis, coming forward when she realized who she was seeing on her TV. She would tell the police the kind of person Nathan was in great detail. Eventually, with his identity no longer in question, more CCTV footage would be found, showing Nathan and David walking along the canal with large shopping bags filled to the brim on several. Occasions. This was not all. 
Blood stains were also discovered under a new carpet in the flat. The couple also had newly purchased a sofa, which led authorities to question what had happened to the old furniture in the house. Again, CCTV footage would come to the rescue, showing that Nathan and David had dumped the blood-stained items at the local tip in broad daylight and in full view of the public. The major breakthrough would come a month and a half after the disappearance, when a male witness came forward, saying he had seen two men walking across the wasteland as he took a smoke break. Police searched the same spot the witness described and found two large shopping bags containing human remains. The remains belonged to Julia. More bags were found around the old railway line. Julia Rawson had been cut into 11 separate pieces, some of which had been done with expert precision, while the rest had an amateur or rough look to them. With this discovery, the police concluded that two persons had been involved in the murder and disposal, likely Nathan being the precise cutter and David the amateur. More evidence followed found at an incinerator close to Nathan's mother's house. Those included blood-stained clothing and a lot of Julia's DNA. Despite the mountain of evidence pointing to the men, they denied any involvement in Julia's death. In fact, they said they weren't responsible for her ending up dead, but admitted to spending time with her and being aware she was dead. According to their accounts, her death was an accident. Again, all evidence pointed to these being lies. Despite having just killed someone, David and Nathan went about their lives normally, spending time with family, in chatting about TV shows that they had enjoyed. Unfortunately, even though the body had been discovered, there was no indication of the time or cause of death, thanks to the body being dismembered. Authorities could only speculate that Julia Rawson was murdered sometime between the early hours of May 12, 2019 and May 14, 2019. Neither man has confessed to or shared details about the murder to date. Jurors at the trial of Maynard Ellis and Leasley heard how Nathan was fascinated with decapitation and horror films, and how he was addicted to fantasies about the sexualized killing of women. Counsel for the prosecution, Kareem Khalil Qusi, told jurors at the start of the trial that his victims would have seen swords and spiders mounted on the walls of the Tipton flat, reptiles kept in tanks, and gory face masks of horror film characters. Miss Rawson could not have known that she was about to enter a flat of horrors, but she must have realized this very soon after she went in. Police said Nathan Maynard Ellis had gone out on the night of the murder with the sole aim of finding a victim. David waited for them in the apartment. Unfortunately, that victim was Julia. No one knew why Julia decided to go back to Nathan's flat in Tipton after meeting him by chance, but anyone who knew Julia would recall that she had an outgoing and friendly nature. She was also very trusting and ready to reach out to anyone she felt was in need of help. In a statement, Julia Rawson's family said her loss was felt as keenly on the day of the trial as when they had heard she had first gone missing. Her death has a devastating impact on us. The mutilation of her body and the callous way in which her remains were scattered has revolted us, they said. The judge, Mr. Justice Sewell, told the jury, it has been a very demanding case because of the subject matter. Passing his sentence, Mr. Justice Sewell said that he was sure that both men had attacked Miss Rawson about the head with weapons and had then attempted to cover up their evil act in a cool, calm, and thorough manner. Addressing the couple, he said, you undertook a comprehensive attempt to try and cover up what you had done, and you repeated lies to the police. Only you two knew what happened in the flat, but neither of you has told the truth. The judge further told David Leasley, I am sure that you were enthralled to Maynard Ellis, and would do, and that night did his bidding. Nathan Maynard Ellis was also found guilty of four counts of sexual crimes and making threats to kill relating to historical allegations made by a woman following his arrest, the witness we mentioned earlier. Both Nathan and David admitted to perverting the course of justice and concealing a body, but they still maintained they had no hand in dismembering Julia Rawson. They were both sentenced to life in prison at Warwick Crown Court in December 2020. Nathan Maynard Ellis was told he would serve at least 30 years in prison. David Leasley, as an accomplice, would face a minimum of 19 years for his actions. Unfortunately, some people don't know where to draw the line. In the end, Nathan and David's perverse fascination with serial killers and their evil ways led to the death of someone fondly described as a beautiful human being. Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the murder of Julia Rawson. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.